Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about classical music with guests, Lauren Scalon, music director of Yakima Symphony Orchestra, Denise Dillenbeck, concertmaster of Yakima Symphony, and David Rogers, executive director of Yakima Symphony. So we have a full house. We have all the different functions. Thank you so much for coming. It's just great to have you here. And, uh, and uh, let's get into it. Let's get into classical music. So Lawrence, you are, are the artistic director of, of Yakima Symphony. You also work all around the world. You also work in Denver, Colorado. And you are so connected. Yakima Symphony is so connected to the world of classical music. Uh, talk about how you came to Yakima and, and your whole idea of what classical music means in today's world. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your, your show. Um, I came to Yakima 10 years ago, uh, and it was a, a very standard process uh, in the industry, which was that there was an opening for a music director. And so they, the organization put out the call for a, an international search and people from all over applied. Uh, and then after many, many steps, it ultimately came down to four finalists who uh, would come, who came to Yakima to spend a week there, uh, to conduct the orchestra in rehearsals and concerts, to meet with the board, to meet with other community leaders, and, and have, you know, probably 20 to 30 interviews throughout the course of a week. Um, and, and then they ultimately made the decision. So that, that's how I wound up in Yakima. And uh, in terms of what does classical music mean today, um, it's just, uh, it, even though there are challenges today <laughs> that we're all going through, classical music isn't going anywhere. Uh, classical music has been here for hundreds of years, and no war, no election, no pandemic can make it go away. And uh, it's, it's relevant for everyone. And uh, it's just a, a real pleasure and an honor, frankly, to, to be a part of, of classical music and, and to be a curator of it. And, and it's almost like, you know, carrying a, carrying a torch. Uh, and that torch was passed to me uh, from my father, who was deeply involved with classical music. And, and um, I'm, I'm happy to carry the torch uh, along with so many of my colleagues uh, at this point in time. We're going to go over to David now, because uh, you were talking about how you came to Yakima. I'd like David to talk about how you were brought to Yakima. So this whole idea of creating this dialogue. And then, Denise, we'd love to talk with you about your role and, and how that, that fits sort of in between these two bookends, right? Because you're, you're connected to the community, you're connected to the, the, the uh, artistic staff, and you sort of uh, help to glue everybody into, into this uh, constellation. But David, could you talk a little bit about uh, how you brought Lawrence in and how your board and how the community uh, uh, experienced that part of this matchmaking? Well, believe it or not, Lawrence actually brought me in. <laughs> so so he was, he's been here for 10 years. I've been here for seven. And, uh, you know, it's a fairly small world. You know, there were, every time there's an opening, everybody who's involved in it kind of knows something about it. Uh, but actually, it was through a mutual acquaintance that I'd worked with and, and Lawrence had worked with also uh, that we actually connected and started talking about the orchestra and you know, I had never set foot in the state of Washington before, and Yakima was in the center of Washington. It's not what most people think about. It's the desert, and it's a smaller agricultural community, and, you know, you look at it from across the country. I was coming from Florida and thinking, how do you have an orchestra there? And you know, coming here and seeing how the community has created and what, you know, this isn't just about the orchestra in this community. It's a very generous community that wants to have things like the orchestra, you know, very centered on the quality of life. Uh, and so it was clear there was a lot of support for it. You know, the demographics here seem unlikely for a successful orchestra in many ways. Uh, 
but clearly the board of directors was very much concerned about how, how do we create an orchestra and an organization that really reflects our community and connects with our community in different ways, which is why they brought Lawrence in the first place. I think what you're, what you're speaking to, and it's so interesting, it's we each have preconceptions as to what the environment is for success. But now those preconceptions are being thrown over. And in particular, a place like Yakima, you have um, people who are really interested in experiencing the expertise, the art that other people have, and also contributing to it. So, you know, you come in with your ideas, and then you, you're so um, thrilled with a, a community that is, that is hosting this wonderful uh, uh, symphony. And uh, Lawrence is, is, is in there uh, shaping that, that music as, as the concert master, Denise. How do you experience that uh, dynamic within the Yakima environment? I think that uh, I have loved music since I was a child. And I've realized in the last um, decade of my life that there must have been also a seed planted um, that was about being fascinated with relationship and connection and how people relate to each other because the, um, a huge portion of what I do is about facilitating basically and about um, reading, reading people and um, interpreting. So that's what we do with music. Um, we read the notes on the page and bring it to life and interpret it to the audience. And then we're, my, my job in particular, I get to do a little bit more of that between Lawrence and the, my section and, and the orchestra. And um, uh, there, there wind up being lots of fun ways, I feel like, that I get to do that in Yakima because of the nature of the community. Um, we're able to a level of connection and sort of personal ties uh, with our audience and our patrons. Um, that uh, involves me being in that kind of relationship too. And um, I don't know, there's something really fascinating to me and enjoyable about um, making those connections work. So if you were going to deconstruct a, a, an orchestra, Lawrence, for a lay person, um, how would you describe the composition of the, of the orchestra? And then talk a little bit about how you select the repertoire uh, when you are performing, um, how you plan out in advance, because there's a, there's a huge arc. People just don't show up, you know, and do two rehearsals and then, you know, you're done, right? So, so let's, let's go from the point of view of someone who is not in this world, but experiences the music. How should we, we view the orchestra from your perspective? Sure. Uh, well, going back to the first part of your question, um, to uh, explain what the orchestra is, uh, basically, I'd say the easiest way to say it is that the orchestra consists of four families of instruments. You've got the string family, violins, violas, cellos, and basses. Um, you've got the woodwind family, flutes, oboes, clarinets, and bassoons. You've got the brass family, horns, trumpets, trombones, and tuba. And then you've got the percussion family, which is timpani, bass drum, snare drum, and hundreds of other instruments, anything that they can uh, hit, shake, or scrape, basically. So that's what makes up an orchestra. Um, and I would say, just to clarify, by definition, you have to have strings to be uh, an orchestra. If, 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 you only, if you don't have strings, then it's another ensemble, for example, a wind ensemble or a band. But... Um, the, the strings are the core foundation of the orchestra and every um, section is extremely important, but that's sort of the definition. Then in terms of the programming process, um, you know, different people do it differently, different conductors and different organizations, but here's the process that I have come to develop and, and be very comfortable with. And I like it to be very collaborative. Um, Although by contract, my, my contract basically says, you know, I can program whatever I want, you know, artistic authority. Um, what I like to do is start by um, gathering input from everybody in, in the organization. So I always ask David, uh, when we start the planning process, to send out uh, an email 
to all of our constituents under our umbrella. That means all the musicians in the orchestra, the singers in the chorus, uh, the staff, the board, the youth orchestra. Um, you know, I, I, I ask for, I solicit opinions from everybody, basically requests. I, I, I take requests. Um, and, uh, and then we, you know, uh, compile those into a spreadsheet and then, and then I'm given the spreadsheet of all the various requests. And this can be for specific pieces, composers, soloists, concert themes, season themes, whatever. Uh, and so that's the starting point. And, and then I start looking for pieces. Um, and, and by the way, I should also include that I also have my own requests and I, I add those to the lists. Um, and, and then I just start looking for uh, pieces that I think would be good for the orchestra to play and specifically uh, good for our uh, community to hear and enjoyable for our community to hear. And each community is different. I work with many different orchestras that they're not all the same. And so I don't program always the same music. Um, and then also we have to consider things like what has been played recently and not to keep playing the same thing. So I have my, my own personal rule is a, is a five year window. I don't like to repeat um, pieces within five years with the exception of certain pieces that are repeated every year, for example, you know, uh, the 1812 Overture on the 4th of July or, or the Nutcracker at Christmas time, you know, other than those types of traditions, um, I don't like to repeat uh, any given piece within a five year period. And so then I start I really like what you, what, what you, how you describe the process as a business workflow, as well as a series of artistic um, decisions at, with, with reference to community preferences, musician input. You know, this, this whole approach is so, uh, it, it's a combination of different competencies, right? There, there is a, an artistic vision the vision of the music director who really understands the repertoire and the history. But you also have this whole workflow so that you can get input, you can organize, you can make sure that you're not repeating. There are business competencies that imbue this and it's very, very modern in sensibility of what you're describing. Yeah, well, it's, it's a wonderful process. In fact, it's my second favorite part of, of being a music director and conductor is the programming. I, I love programming. Um, of course, my first favorite part is the concerts. That, that's what it's really all about. So when you're interacting with the musicians and the audiences, not, I, I wouldn't want to suggest that musicians might have some preferences and some strong feelings about their art, but let's assume that that, that might be the case. Denise, you're, you're sitting within the orchestra, you're, uh, you're interacting with the community, you're interacting with Lawrence. Um, how do you ensure that people feel like they are able to communicate out? And then at a certain point, a decision is made and then they carry water for that decision. So how does that, from your perspective, how does that, that flow and how do you engage people? And as a concert master, how do you ensure that that part of what Lawrence was describing is undertaken? Um, yeah, that's a really great question and a really huge part of what I do. Um, the command that is sort of traditional that's been established in the field with how, how communication and questions happen in a rehearsal setting so that um, not everybody's time is taken up by every little thing that occurs to anybody on stage. Um, so questions should get filtered up by a tap on the shoulder um, to me. Um, and then I get to either answer them or decide like if this is something worthy of interrupting rehearsal and asking Lawrence to address to the to the whole crowd. Um, so there's there's that part of it. But there's also I feel like uh, an important part of what I do is to show clearly enough um, in the way that I play um, what exactly we're trying to, that people will have questions answered just by that modeling. Um, and also to, in my communication style, um, to foster a sense of uh, competence and sort of acceptance uh, among the community of the orchestra players. So that there's a feeling that um, everybody knows what's going on. They're all part of it. They're all invested. And, um, and they feel like there's, 
there are people who are going to take their concerns seriously. Um, and there's a, a way of expressing those concerns that um, answers them without grinding things to a halt. And, and as this process is unfolding, David, you're thinking about the audience. You want people engaged. You want people attending, right? You want people to feel like they have ownership so that when the performance happens, you're selling tickets. Those, those seats are filled. How do you ensure that that piece of it, that anticipatory piece, the marketing piece, how do you ensure that that unfolds successfully? You know, we, we don't really look at it just as marketing. You know, it's really what is the role of the orchestra in the larger community and in the larger region. And that applies on the musician level as well as at the audience level. Uh, where a lot of what we do is just show up in other places so that we're always part of conversations. We're always trying to grow the audience. We're trying to make what we do easier to access. Uh, you know, a lot of orchestras have begun giving up on the subscription model altogether, for instance, but we have had more subscribers than ever in the last uh, several years. And it really is about the relationships, just what Denise was talking about, that, that we're doing everything we can to really create a sense among uh, our audience and outside our audience even that people really do have an investment in, in what we're doing. Uh, whether it's in the music itself, there are some people who may only come to a particular concert because they love the music on that concert. But over the years that Lawrence has been here, he's developed this sense of trust that whatever music we do, you're gonna like it. It's gonna be, it's gonna be great. And, and it's, it's that very careful kind of programming, listening to what the community is saying and suggesting, but also introducing people to things that they wouldn't have thought of, making connections, unexpected connections that people say, oh, I need to go back and see that again because I wouldn't have thought of this otherwise. You know, in order for you to have this, this great symphony, in order for you, Lawrence, and you, Denise, to have this great experience and performance, you need audiences. Uh, we just took a poll in which we asked how often people listen to classical music. And of course, people who are watching this show probably have a greater than average propensity to, to attend. We had about 50% saying that they listened to classical music. They attended concerts, live performance. About um, ha half of them said often and, and about 25% said sometimes. 25% said rarely. But there is, it's undeniable that the classic uh, arts sector um, has an audience challenge. Uh, Lawrence, how do you meet that challenge? Because if we keep doing the same thing in the same way, we're likely to end up with the same trajectory, which is not as rigorous as we would like. How do we adjust? How do we ensure that we have buy-in of all ages, of all genders, of all races, of, all, uh, of everyone across, across the United States and the world? Right. Well, I, I think as we've already talked about, programming is a huge part of it. And I, I think that what we need to do and what we do do in Yakima is basically have something for everyone throughout the course of the season. Um, and I mean, you can't have something for everyone on one specific concert in, in 90 minutes. It just doesn't work. But over the course of the, of the season, we play on the one hand, the absolute standards and you know beloved classical music that that people recognize and know and come to expect. We also play new music that is you know fresh, fresh off the printer um, uh, from all different types of places, from composers from many different countries, from all different races, religions, and everything. Um, we we play you know, undiscovered gems, you know, pieces that could have been written, for example, decades or centuries ago, but aren't quite as famous as Beethoven's Fifth or, you know, Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony or whatever. Um, because, you know, on the one hand, some people want to hear only the classics that they know. Other people, they've heard them many times. They want to hear something different. Uh, some people like new music. Some people don't like new music, et cetera. And by over the course of a season, basically having something for everyone, including by the way, popular music, because we, we have pop series too. Um, it, you know, everything from, from big band shows to movie music, Broadway music, 
uh, rock shows. Uh, you know, s sadly, one of, one of the concerts um, we probably won't be doing this year because of, of COVID, but we'll, we'll do it as soon as we can when we open up, what was, was to be a, an all music of Queen show, Bohemian Rhapsody, um, with a wonderful cover band that you know, plays all the Queen songs. So, so over the course of the season, we have something for everyone. I would so, just say, if, if we're talking about classical music, that's kind of shorthand for something, but it's not just classical. It is really so many different kinds of music and that's different from orchestras maybe 50 years ago. We've had you know, the same conversations about, are you still gonna have an audience have been happening for 50 years, but the orchestra looks different. The musicians in the orchestra 50 years ago probably haven't had the variety of musical experiences and interests that musicians now grow up with, with everything. So all of this becomes more natural. And as the orchestra changes and the, they change with the audience over time. And I think oh. that helps keep everything current. It's such a great point. I, 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 was, I was trying to raise it and, and, and you all jumped in and you, you did it far better than I could have. This whole idea of hybridized um, definitions where we're, we're no longer pure, we no longer stay in a lane, but we take advantage of the fact that we're so exposed to so many different uh, disciplines. It, it, does that pose particular uh, challenges for musicians who um, as they're, um, they're, they're uh, 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 traversing the repertoire that Lawrence uh, described, Denise, um, that, that they might have to adopt their playing style um, from their, their more uh, comfortable modalities uh, to the challenges of taking a, a classical um, training um, and then applying it within a different context. I think that there definitely is uh, a challenge to that, but that's part of being an artist and, and part of, um, it should be part of all of our training, um, certainly to um, just be constantly broadening our skill set as well as our frame of reference and our interests. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's the growth mindset. It's what keeps you, um, engaged and curious and alive and joyful. Um, so it's definitely, definitely a challenge, but hopefully it's one that um, everyone in the orchestra is um, nurturing on a regular basis in their own practice, even before they get to our concerts. Uh, Mark, if you don't mind, if I, if I could jump in on that question as well. Um, in my opinion, that is uh, one of the beauties of, of classical training, is which is grounded in developing a really solid technique on one's instrument and also grounded on uh, developing really good music reading skills, when, which all of our musicians have. Uh, in fact, that's what we audition them on when, when they're coming into the orchestra. And with those skills, and with sheet music in front of them in any style, whether it be you know, classical music, rock music, jazz music, you know, from any country, with those skills, we can essentially play anything. And that's the beauty of classical training. I, 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 I am so captivated by that. You know, I make reference to Art Tatum, the great, great jazz pianist who was a master of technique and could do pretty much anything from stride to a very, very classical styles. And, and that idea of uh, being a vehicle for your instrument, but also making the vehicle, uh, the instrument a vehicle for your fluid voice and, and that fluidity of moving from style to style is so fascinating to me. Um, what, as, as you're thinking, Lawrence, about the whole idea of connecting people and the, the role of education, for people who are semi-ignorant as I am of, of, of this art form, how do you connect uh, those of us who know so much less than the people on this screen to the art form, to the behind the scenes piece? And we're trying to do it here, uh, but, but you have programming, um, you, you are shaping these experiences. Uh, and, and I'm wondering whether you, do you talk from the podium when you, when you are conducting, do you, turn around and, and, and talk with the audience because they're different styles. How do you see education in that engagement piece? Right. Well, first of all, I like to use the starting point that 
it, to get rid of fear of classical music, a lot of people think, well, I, I don't know anything about it, so I'm not going to go or I'm not going to listen to it. Let, let's have a starting point of you don't have to know anything. Right. It's just beautiful music, interesting, exciting, passionate music that all you have to do is sit down in the chair and listen and you can still enjoy it. Now, that said, getting back to your question, um, the more one knows about anything, you know, the more they can get into it and enjoy it even more. Um, and so absolutely, we have all types of um, education, including a little bit of talking from the stage. I don't like to do it too much, but certainly at one or two points in every concert, I, I will uh, talk to the audience from the stage, especially if we have um, a re relatively new piece, whether it be you know, written recently or even a piece that's 200 years old, but new to the audience because it's one of these undiscovered gems. You know, I might say something about pieces like that. Uh, we have pre-concert lectures that are done in, in the case of the Yakima Symphony, they're done by our principal horn player, who's also a musicologist and a professor uh, and a wonderful speaker. So he does a great job with the pre-concert lectures. Uh, the day before every concert, we have a series called Lunch with Lawrence where we invite uh, all the patrons to, to a lunch, uh, just a, a nice buffet lunch at a restaurant. And we're sit, uh, seated in sort of a, a round table format. And after we enjoy this nice lunch, then I get up and talk about all the music that they're going to hear the next night at the concert. Um, and it, it, we often bring in the guest soloist, if there is one, to, to also talk about the concert from their perspective. Um, so yeah, we, we have, uh, and then not to mention all our uh, official education programs for, you know, for youngsters, which is almost a whole, whole nother uh, segment. But what I was talking I would, about first- I would say we, we also have something that's probably a little unusual in that our local paper has asked for a column every week that we provide. So we can talk about music on the program. We can talk about things behind the scenes. And actually the pandemic has given us an opportunity to do something else that we really sh should have probably been doing earlier. Right now we have music from home every week. We ha release a video created by a musician that explores some part of their world behind the scenes that audiences would never know about otherwise. You know, we did two polls. Um, one was um, uh, whether people are listening to classical music uh, using tech whether it's the mobile tech or radio or television or whatever. And we, we found that 80% that, um, uh, roughly are listening to classical music through technology um, in some way, either often or sometimes, 40% often, 40% sometimes. And we also took another uh, poll, which I'd like to, uh, to throw over to you, David, about um, as we exit the, the uh, pandemic, what are the biggest challenges faced by these uh, symphonies? And, and about 40% people said recovering financially because people recognize that challenge. And the other piece is reestablishing uh, re -establishing the relationship with the audience, uh, which we talked a little bit about, Lawrence, before, uh, before the show started. Uh, David, could you talk about how you are preparing for the exit from COVID? Because during this time, uh, you haven't been able to give live performance but you certainly are planning to exit with a bang, aren't you? Uh, indeed, we don't know when, but, uh, but throughout all of this period, we are really highly focused on connecting with our audience in whatever ways we can, whether it's these videos or we can call them, we have periodic live events uh, online that people can participate in. Uh, I guess, to me, one of the real concerns I have is the, there's a larger ecosystem of the musicians. We rely on musicians from all over the Pacific Northwest. About 40% live here in central Washington, but a lot of them, we get to enjoy the talents of a much larger pool of musicians. By the same token, they rely on us. And when we're not able to provide that, and it's not just the orchestra financially, it's also our musicians financially. Some of them can teach online. There, there are different ways of doing it, but uh, that's gonna be a really, uh, serious focus, I think, for the next few months until we can come out and actually start playing again. And, and I would just add, it goes, goes beyond the musicians and the staff of the orchestra. 
the waiters and cooks at the local restaurants. I mean, there's so much that, so many people that benefit financially and employment wise from even just a single symphony orchestra concert that if it doesn't happen, a lot of people struggle as a result. Denise, how are your uh, musicians uh, uh, faring uh, there? Are, are they able to do what David said uh, in terms of uh, providing um, education and, and keeping their, their skills uh, intact? I think, uh, I think there's a broad range of uh, stuff that's happening. Um, lots of different puzzle pieces are going into um, each individual's um, framework of how to survive. Um, there's definitely a lot of online teaching going on. I had quit teaching for the last four years so that I could perform more, but I'm, I actually have a trickle of students online now just to float. And um, I think uh, some people are, are plugged in well to organizations that are already sort of supplying them with a format for um, for work and staying financially afloat. In terms of um, staying alive artistically, um, it seems to me like in my experience and, and most of the people that I talk to, um, that it's been somewhat of a roller coaster, that, um, that there are, uh, there have been uh, times where it, it's felt like what a gift to, uh, like I've, practiced a couple pieces that were on my bucket list that I've never had time to work on before. Um, and there were sort of lots of new moments of things gelling in my practice time and feeling um, inspired and happy because of just having time to, to give to it. And then there was bottoming out <laughs> with the lack of a, um, an audience to share that with. And um, everyone I've talked to, it seems like goes through that um, and um, I don't know. It'll, it'll be interesting to see um, with the vaccine and everything, what we all think about it afterwards. Um, Lawrence, we're going we're gonna to end with you. We're going to ask you to take us out. Um, what can we all do to help you ensure that, that classical music performance remains vital? Um, and, and how can we function, whether we're sitting on the board of the Yakima Symphony, a member of the community, a uh, member of the audience, a musician, um, how do we confront so that as we exit the pandemic, classical music, classical performance is strengthened, these institutions are strengthened going forward? Really, it, it's quite simple. Dur during the pandemic, um, for people who have donated to orchestras in the past, please continue those don donations. If you have the capacity to give even more, that would be much appreciated. Uh, and then after the pandemic is over and we start uh, putting on concerts again, all you need to do is come to the concerts. If we fill the halls with people to come to the concerts, everything else falls into place. Come and listen, come and enjoy, right? Absolutely. Well, thank you all for sharing your work with us, for giving us a peek behind the curtain. Uh, Lawrence Galan, Denise Dillenbeck, David Rogers of the Yakima Symphony Orchestra. That's the nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you so much for coming. Those of you on Facebook and the social media live streams, thank you so much and, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.